So, so what I really want to do is, is, uh, is talk about uh, the concepts of oncolytic viruses and, and use them in the biology we've, we've come to understand and, and really the biology of, of host uh, virus interactions. I think both Howard and Kaiway gave, gave great talks because it, it pointed out a really important fact and that is that patients are very heterogeneous, how they respond to viruses is very heterogeneous and we need to understand that in order to actually make effective therapeutics and that's really what I want want to speak about today. This is just a picture of Ottawa in the middle of winter. It was quite beautiful. In fact, it was still frozen two weeks ago, except now it's all melted and now we have floods in Ottawa and Montreal. It's been a bit of a disaster year. But um, So just disclosure, I've uh, co-founded a company called Turnstone, which is, uh, which is commercializing some of the viruses I'll speak about. So what I want to do is really, as I said, understand virus host cell interactions. I want to speak about that and how we can use that to uh, to improve the chances of having a thera good therapeutic outcome. Um, the concept that you've heard about a little bit from Howard is that you can have this in situ vaccine effect where the actual act of virus infection of tumor leads to an immune response that leads to an uh, uh, effective anti-tumor uh, response that um, we can actually not only build on that in situ effect but do what I call double downing, double down on that effect by encoding antigens into the oncolytic virus so it's, it's behaving both as an oncolytic virus and as a, an oncolytic, as a vaccine. And finally, uh, use a, a, sort of a new concept that we haven't published yet, but I thought it'd be interesting for you to hear about, is the concept of using oncolytic viruses to reprogram the tumor microenvironment using exosomes as carriers of, of therapeutic payloads that are actually encoded in the oncolytic virus. So just to get started, uh, we've heard a little bit about why are these oncolytic viruses working, what's the selectivity in, involved in them, and I'll just, just take a step back and think about tumor evolution. What happens when a tumor evolves? It starts at a healthy cell, it acquires epigenetic or genetic mutations in that, in that cell that leads to a, eventually a front and malignant tumor, things that we're very familiar with now, changes in apoptotic programs, uh, changes in metabolism. Probably one of the most important as far as we're concerned is, is finding ways to escape immune recognition and so on. And, and these are all things that we know now, in generally speaking, happens when a tumor evolves from a, a normal cell to a malignant cell. I think the most important thing that I want to get home to you is that the, the same process that control cell growth, uh, cell growth, cell death, apoptosis, metabolism, immune invasion, all those things also are programs that are involved in controlling the ability of individual cells to fight virus infections. Okay, so inherently a tumor cell has acquired mutations and pathways which it would normally use to fight a virus infection and so as a result inherently tumor cells are susceptible to some extent and as Kyle I pointed out it's going to be different between different cells and different patients uh, to virus infection. So it, just to put it in a slightly different way, if you think about a healthy cell, when it gets infected, it's an altruistic cell. It doesn't want the body to get an infection, so it does everything it can to, to prevent the spread of the virus. So the virus may infect that cell. It'll turn on things like interferons, but many other kinds of programs as well. Uh, interferons get expressed. They turn on antiviral programs. About 2,500 genes get elaborated in this, uh, when this happens. And things that, that, that healthy cell will stop its own growth. It'll sometimes commit suicide. It'll call in the immune system. It'll, it'll say, don't, don't grow any blood vessels towards me. It'll do everything it can to keep the virus from spreading because it's an altruistic cell that wants the body to live. But a cancer cell is just the opposite of that, right? It, it doesn't care about the body. It really wants to grow forever. It's immortalized. It never wants to commit suicide. And so as a result, the, 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 the same programs you would normally use to, to fight a virus infection at the single cell level are often eliminated in a cancer cell. Okay. And this isn't just a an observation or a phenomenology, this is actually well documented now. If you look at the literature, you can find that many of the players that we're very familiar with uh, in, the, in the tumor genesis field, things like MYC, P53, RB, RAS, all these kinds of uh, activated pathways or tumor suppressors are now known to talk to the interferon pathway. They're known that they actually impact an interferon. So for instance, MAC, a MYC over expression, expression leads to downregulation of the interferon response. So as a result, I would say it's quite clear that at least to some extent, every cancer cell is more sensitive to virus infection than a normal cell. And that's what we can exploit with oncolytic viruses, try to exploit that susceptibility to enhance uh, virus killing of, of cancers. So just to give you one example, that this is actually a little bit different because I've been talking about cancer cells being susceptible to virus infection because of these inherent genetic effects. But we also found that some normal cells would be enhanced to oncovirus infection as well. This is work done by uh, Rosanna in my lab, who's a postdoc. And what she showed is that there's a crosstalk between the VEGF activated pathways and interferon pathways. They actually talk to each other. 
And that's because when you have a cut or you, you want to heal, you, you might want to have some angiogenesis for a short time. You may want to have some inflammation, maybe shut it down. And so those two pathways actually talk to each other. And she was able to show that when VEGF binds to its receptor, it leads to the proliferation of vascular endothelial cells, as you'd expect, so that the blood vessel can heal. But it also shuts down the interferon resp response through a, a, a transcription repressor that's turned on following VEGF activation of its receptor called PRD1 BF1 or BLIMP1. And that actually shuts down the interferon response within the, uh, within the uh, vascular endothelial cell. So in a normal sense, that's fine. If you have a cut, you, you might want to turn that off and then turn it on again in a homeostatic way. But in a cancer, when you, when you uh, pathologically express VEGF, what you end up doing is constitutively suppressing the interferon response. And that's just shown here in a, uh, an infection of a, a mouse tumor, in this case, with a, a virus which expresses GFP when it protectively infects. And I think you can sort of see in this picture here that there's blood vessels and the actual endothelial cell wall of that blood vessel is infected by the virus because that particular blood vessel has shut down its interferon response because it's constantly bathed in VEGF. Now this won't be true for all oncolytic viruses because the virus has to have a receptor that can enter into an endothelial cell. Some tumors, as we know, are, are more vascularized, have more VEGF, they might be the ones more sensitive and others less so. But at least in this case, we were able to demonstrate quite clearly that one aspect of oncolytic virus therapy might be through infection of, of tumor vasculature. So this has led to an oncolytic virus uh, paradigm that we're all familiar with now, and that is when a, nor when a virus enters into a normal cell, it will turn on the antiviral response, including interferon production. The virus may start an infection in that first cell, but then it will be shut down. Whereas when it enters into a cancer cell which cannot respond to or cannot produce interferon, that virus will be able to replicate and spread throughout the tumor. That's sort of the concept that we're, we're thinking about. So the real, uh, you heard very nicely from Howard about the concept of using oncolytic viruses as, as local regional therapies and, and hoping to generate a systemic immune response. But there's also the concept of using oncolytic viruses as systemic therapeutics themselves where you'd hopefully infect each tumor uh, within the body. So this is, a, I just want to introduce this one virus I'm going to speak about a little bit now called Marabavirus. virus. We did a, a screen of a, a large number of viruses and before we decided upon Marabavirus as a, a lead candidate that we're now developing through, uh, as I mentioned, Turnstone Biologics. This is a rhabdovirus, which is very similar to the one that you just heard from Kaiwai, VSV. Uh, it's nice because like VSV, we are in, in this room are not immune to it. It's really only propagated in a in Brazil in a, in a sand fly, and so most of us do not have antibodies to, to Marabba virus, and as a result, we should be able to give this virus intravenously for some length of time before you develop antibodies. It's been well engineered, this is all work done by my colleague Dave Stoidel at the Children's Hospital in Eastern Ontario. It's been engineered and we can now use it to manipulate its, its, its biology and, and put in certain payloads. So to give you an example of, of how it can work, this is just a mouse model, a uh, CT26 model, in which we've seeded tumors, and you can see the lungs have got very florid tumor growth, lots of tumors in them. Uh, after we infect with Marabavirus virus expressing GFP, you can see that all those white tumors now turn green. So we are able to give the virus systemically. It finds the tumor. In place it finds the tumor, it starts to seed and infect that tumor, and, and hopefully will lead to tumor clearance. And you can see also that pink section there where there is no tumors, it remains black. So this is exactly what we're trying to get, a systemic therapeutic that would be uh, able to infect distant metastasis and, and, in a very selective fashion. So this works great in CT26 colon cancer uh, tumor models, but not other models. I think it's, as, as Kaiwai showed very nicely in that last uh, couple of slides, there is heterogeneity amongst tumors in mice and in people. Some tumors are going to be like CT26, extremely sensitive, very easy to treat, and others are going to be in between that, and some may be totally resistant. And I, I sort of like to picture it like this. So if you have a patient with a very defective interferon response, 100% of the, the, the response is just totally uh, inactive in that tumor, then oncolysis may be enough to cure that, that patient. On the other hand, in patients in which their tumors are less uh, impaired in their interferon response, you may need to do something else. And as Howard suggested, is generating an immune response might be the most important thing to do in these kinds of patients. And so I sort of look at it as a gradient where you have a tumor that is less responsive to the virus, you want to make sure you do something with that virus to more potently stimulate anti-tumor immune reactions. So I just want to now switch slightly and think about how to use these viruses best. And the, and the one thought that comes to mind is, you know, we, we're always in a way forced into the corner where we have to treat patients who are extremely advanced 
And some kind, sometimes that may work, but often these patients are very immune suppressed and have a huge tumor burden. And would it not be better if we could, we could move this kind of therapy up front a bit, get to a stage where in fact it has a chance to work better because the tumors are smaller, patients are healthier. And so we looked at this concept in the new adjuvant setting for a triple negative breast cancer in a, in a mouse model to start. And the, and the, and the concept was, was actually uh, really developed by a postdoc in my lab, Mary, uh, Mary Claude Bouget Daniel, who's now moved on to have her own lab at the University of Montreal. And what she just, she tested first off was to see is triple negative breast cancer, which is really a, a big problem in the breast cancer field, is it susceptible to virus infection? And then this picture here just shows you an example. Uh, on the top is no virus treatment. You can just see various stains that there's actually a very uh, robust tumor growth. This is, uh, these are PDX models we got from Elena Welm at the University of Utah. But after treatment with Mirab intravenously, the tumor becomes disrupted by the virus, the virus continues to spread and it has a, a therapeutic outcome. So we knew that inherently some triple negative breast cancers are susceptible to virus infection. So what Mary Claude then did is said, what happens when that infection occurs? Does the tumor change in any way? And, and, the, and the answer was that what we see is that, as, as Howard pointed out with some of his models, we start to see a change in the tumor microenvironment where you go from a, a very cold tumor, so on the bottom is just of each of those, these are just two separate models. When we use UV inactivated Mirabovirus, of Mirabovirus that can't replicate, you see it stays blue, very cold, the, 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 there are not very good immune responsive genes turned on. But after infection with Mirabovirus, that tumor warms up quite well, it gets hotter, because it now expresses a lot of immune responsive genes, which is, which is really a good thing. And so this can lead to a situation where we have what we call the in situ vaccination effect. As you've heard from Howard, is that it's, it's sort of an antigen agnostic. It doesn't care what the antigen is. It lets the immune system do the work for you. So in this concept, the virus is given intravenously. It seeds in the tumor, it infects and spreads. It starts to lead to tumor lysis, it heats up the tumor microenvironment, allows antigens to be eaten uh, by dendritic cells and presented to the immune system. And then hopefully T cells come back in and attack that tumor and, and begin to get a, a second effect. So you get the onco oncolysis followed by an immune attack. So in the triple negative breast cancer setting, what we said, well, can we, can we see if this happens in, in patients, or not in patients, in this case, the mouse model, can we use this, this kind of concept to treat uh, these animals in the new adjuvant setting? So in other words, we, imp we implant a tumor on day zero. We then treat it with Mirabovirus, either intravenously or intratumorally directly into the tumor. We wait some length of time, in this case, eight days. We then resect that tumor. We know in these particular models they'll spontaneously relapse 100% of the time, but to sort of accelerate the process, we now re-implant the tumor again. So the virus only appears once on day seven. There's no virus after that point. And what we're asking is what, what is the outcome? And I think you can see in the bottom here, the sort of the compressed bars there show you what we, how we, the, the study starts off. So you can see that untreated tumors continue to grow. With Mirab, you see a little bit of a delta. You start to, start to see some impact. We then do surgery on uh, day 15. And then we wait a little while and reimplant tumors. And what you can see is if we don't treat those animals at all, the tumors that you put in the second time grow just as fast as the first tumor. But if we add, had previously treated with Mirabovirus, we now see that those tumors are retarded in their growth. And in fact, in some cases, it's, it's a really a very good outcome. The, patient, the mice don't actually develop a second tumor, as you can see in the bottom there. So in some cases, this pre-treatment before surgery allowed us to generate an immune response against the antigens found in that tumor, and if the tumor tries to come back, the immune response is able to hold it at bay and keep it from recurring. But still, if you look down there, what's 20% of the uh, EM, uh, or what's it, maybe 30% of the EMT6 tumors might respond, well, mice might keep a recurrence from happening, but most of them don't. So the question is, why can't we do better than this? And it comes back to the concept that you heard earlier of the fact that the actual productive immune response that you generate in this way is actually counterproductive in the sense that it turns on immune checkpoint inhibitors. So when you infect a tumor cell, dendritic cells activate T cells, those T cells rush into the tumor, one of the things they'll unfortunately do is also initiate uh, expression of immune checkpoints like PD-L1 and shut themselves down. It's an autoregulatory system that we have built into our bodies to help us actually in, in the clearing and regulation of, of uh, virus infections. But in fact, in this case, what happens is the tumor cell expresses the checkpoint and shuts down the response. And so the concept here, can we add an immune checkpoint and overcome that problem? And, and so, of course, that's what we did in our neoadjuvant setting. And what you can see here is, in fact, 
it works much better when you add immune checkpoints. So we now can, in some cases, cure 100, almost 100% of these animals or prevent recurrence in 100% of these animals. So this is, I think, one setting where it might be, make a lot of sense to use oncolytic viruses in that neoadjuvant setting where patients still have a chance to respond before their tumors have become so overwhelming that they really don't have an opportunity to respond. The problem, though, we felt with the in situ effect is that we couldn't predict when it would happen, even though it's defined most models, you see not all of them responded. And so is there some way that we can make the immune response happen more frequently and in a predictable fashion? And so the idea here was is, is find some way to improve the immune response. And so our idea was to add a tumor antigen, if you could find one, to the virus itself. So now the virus is being both an oncolytic virus, so it's going to replicate and kill the tumor, but also a vaccine at the same time. And this is work I do with the colleagues, uh, as you can see at the bottom here, at McMaster University and the University of Guelph and, and Dave in Ottawa. So here's the concept. We want to combine not only the oncolytic virus concept, but the concept that's well established in vaccinology of a heterologous prime boost. Because the problem we have when we use viruses as therapeutics is they're very immunogenic themselves. And we want to keep the immune system from focusing on the virus and focus it instead on what we're trying it to get it to react to, which is the tumor. So in this case, we encode a tumor antigen in a priming vaccine. In this case, we used a non-replicating adenovirus vector to start with. Use the same tumor antigen in the Maraba virus, which is going to replicate. Because there's heterologous prime boost, that means you have two different vectors. The immune system sees the tumor antigen twice in the prime boost setting, but it only sees each of these viruses once. And our dream is we'll actually get good oncolysis, good heating up of the tumor, but also a potent immune response. And so just to give you an example of the kind of data we generate in, in mice, this is uh, on the left, you can see we, we waited until these animals had fairly hef hefty burden. This is a B16 melanoma tumor. We uh, let them establish metastatic tumors throughout their body. We then prime them with an adenovirus uh, when the lungs look like this, uh, expressing dopachrome tetomerase. It's a self-antigen. It's a melanoma antigen, DCT. We waited as long as we could. The animals are really getting uh, quite ill at this point, starting to have labored breathing. They're not going to survive much longer. And we now give them the oncolytic uh, Maraba virus, also expressing DCT. And so what we hope is that the virus will now become an oncolytic, but also boost a, a tremendous immune response. And so that's exactly what we see in these, in these uh, models. And so what you see here is um, on the left there is empty vector. We're looking at CD8, immune res CD8 T cells responding to the self-antigen. Okay, and this is percentage of circulating T cells in the blood. So we just take a blood sample and we just do flow cytometry right away. It's not been expanded in any way. So you can see that the empty vector, there's no response. If we just use the adenovirus prime, we see a small response. If we use adenovirus prime and Maraba with an irrelevant antigen, we see again about the same as the adenovirus prime. But when we use the prime and boost with the heterologous system, we now see that in some animals, up to 50% of their T cells now recognize this DCT antigen, which is quite remarkable. And again, uh, in this very advanced model, you can see that the blue curve there shows you the priming and boosting with Maraba. And we can generate, uh, in these animals, about 30% can have a, a, a complete cure, even though they had, we're in a very uh, difficult state to start with, which is great. But again, considering that 50% of their T cells were recognized in this antigen, why aren't all the animals getting cured? And so it comes back to the concept of the immune checkpoints again. So if we now add in immune checkpoints, we can take that 30 40% and we can increase it to about 100%. So by doing the heterologous prime boost, we're heating up the tumor, we're getting a potent T cell response, and then by adding in checkpoints, overlaying that with checkpoints, we can potentiate that and essentially cure all these animals, even with very, very advanced disease. This work was done by Kyle Stevenson. So, so you, you know, you might ask, why are we seeing such potent immune responses? This is a really, if you think about it, if half of your T cells now recognize it as self-antigen, that's quite remarkable. And so what's the biology behind that? So we, we actually compared what we were doing to stuff that was in the literature. And if you look at other kinds of prime boosts, like the Listeria, Listeria prime boost that's being developed by uh, Duro and Advaxis at, at, at one point. And if you look at something like the HPV E6, E7 antigen, you can see what we're getting there on the right-hand side, about 60% of the T cells responding against that antigen, whereas uh, in another prime boost setting, it's, it's really quite low. So there's something quite different about what we're doing compared to other kinds of prime boosting. And so uh, some colleagues of mine, again at McMaster, figured out exactly what was going on, what was the unique biology here. One thing is we're using a vaccine as an intravenous agent. So if you ask a vaccine person, how do you vaccinate this? Well, it's IM or it's intranodal or it's, it's sub-Q or something. Nobody gives vaccines intravenously. 
we only gave it intravenously because we're oncolytic virus people and we're trying to give the oncolytic virus intravenously. And what we discovered is that by giving the virus intravenously and coating this antigen, it accessed a, an immune compartment that's normally not accessed by a vaccine. And that's a splenic follicle that's found uh, within the spleen. And it turns out that uh, this follicle is very unique biology. It has a B cell in it, which is really there only to allow it to be infected and, and create antigens. It's got dendritic cells, which eat the, the B cell when it dies and any antigens expresses. And it has central memory T cells. And so then this dendritic cell can, can stimulate the central memory T cell and allow it to expand tremendously. What's not allowed in the follicle are T effector cells. So as you know, a T effector cell can go and kill its target, but it can also kill dendritic cells that are presenting the target in the first place. And it's a feedback system we have in our immune systems to control immune responses. But because the T effectors are excluded from these follicles, the central memory T cells can be dramatically expanded. That's why we think we're seeing such dramatic responses. So in our paradigm, we vaccinate with adenovirus to generate the central memory T cells. They go inside the splenic follicle. They're, they're protected from T effector cells. And then when Mirabavirus comes in by the intravenous route, we now access this and, and lead to a, a tremendous immune response. I want to switch more to, to a slightly different topic. So that, that's sort of talking about how understanding the biology of the virus and the, and, the, and the animal and the virus and the immune system allows us to enhance therapy. I want to end now on, on talking a little bit more about a, a topic that uh, Kawe was referring to, and that is the fact that there's heterogeneity in tumors and in patients in terms of the response to these viruses. And how can we change the, the uh, paradigm where a, a patient who has a very resistant tumor, for instance, can now become a very sensitive tumor? How can we push in this direction? And this is work done by a postdoc lab, Larissa Picor. What she did is she took some cells which were resistant to virus infection or refractory to oncolysis to some extent, and then she did a CRISPR-Cas9 screen on those and looked for genes you could knock out to sensitize, to sensitize this, the tumor and to make it more sensitive to infection. And what she found was really quite interesting. She found repeatedly that if she knocked out components of the SWI-SNF chromatin remodeling complex, she made tumors that were resistant sensitive to infection. And this was on a, we, it's not something that we predicted at all. So we found things that we could knock out in the SWI sniff chromatin remodeling complex, which made these resistant tumor cells now become sensitive. And so, you know, we didn't know why that was, and I don't think we have a clear idea yet, except that we believe probably chromatin remodeling is required to elaborate a good uh, antivirus response within a tumor cell. Um, but one, I want to speak briefly about one particular gene product, that's ARID1A which is interesting because it has a tumor angle to it as well. And she found that uh, ARID1A was a, a, a gene that she could knock out and make cells become more uh, virus sensitive. And so we wanted to see, can we, can we exploit that observation? So this is work I've done with a colleague of mine, Caroline Ilko, at the uh, Ottawa Hospital. Uh, and what we decided to do was to encode within uh, a virus a microRNA to try to enhance uh, infection by knocking out ARID1A. And so what we show you in this particular cell line here, that on the left-hand side you can see the parental cell line is, is really only modestly sensitive to VSV in this particular case. Uh, MOI of 1 is actually very high for VSV. It it's, it's, uh, usually can kill off at, at really quite low MOIs. If we knock out ARID1A with uh, CRISPR-Cas9, the cells become very sensitive to, to VSV. So if we now encode a microRNA in VSV, which can itself knock out ARID1A, we now take and create a virus which can now infect this previously resistant cell line. So you can see now on the right-hand side that both the, uh, the ARID1A knockout and the parental cell line are sensitive to this new virus, which expresses a microRNA that's going to target ARID1A. Okay, so that was great because it said we could engineer the virus to be able to exploit these, these knockouts we'd identified we can encode microRNA so perhaps make that virus able to infect more, more effectively. Back to Howard's talk, for instance, you might want to knock out Sting as an example. You could encode Sting in this thing. That's one, one possibility. But we also thought, that's great, but it only impacts the cell that you infect. Wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow get this to, to spread throughout the tumor and make all the tumor cells sensitive to virus infection? So could we go beyond cell autonomous expression of this artificial microRNA and instead have it somehow transmitted to all the cells within the tumor to prepare them for virus infection. And, and this is something that viruses in nature do already. 
So some viruses, like the herpes viruses and, and, and uh, HCC, uh, they actually, uh, hepatitis C, pardon me, they actually encode microRNAs that they then package into exosomes and send out to uninfected cells to prepare them for virus infection. This is natural biology that viruses have already figured out. So we said, can we do this? Can we create an oncolytic virus that would encode a microRNA? That microRNA would be expressed during the infection of that first cell, but then it will be packaged into exosomes and go off to secondary cells and, and knock down, for instance, in this case, the ARD1A, and prepare them for infection so that when the virus now spreads to the second tumor cell line, a tumor, tumor, uh, cell in the tumor, it will be able to replicate and spread and sort of amplify that signal. So we were able to show that, in fact, this is the case for this particular microRNA. We created it in such a way that we thought it would be packaged into exosomes. And just to show you here, we made exosomes, and in fact, the ARD1A microRNA is actually packaged into exosomes and infected cells. Uh, one last thing about ARD1A, which is cool, we were able to exploit, is ARD1A is synthetic lethal with another uh, important chromatin remodeling uh, enzyme called EZH2. It's a, a methyltransferase. So in normal cells, so like all of us have, ARD1A and EZH2 are both there. Uh, you know, everything's wonderful. If you knock out ARD1A, EZH2 is still there to compensate for that loss of ARD1A. Everything's still okay. But if you knock out EZH2 in an ARD1A knockout cell, the cell dies. It's synthetic lethal. Okay, so we thought, can we use this concept of synthetic lethality to exploit with our, our exosome-delivered uh, uh, microRNAs? And so this is an experiment done by Mary Eve, which is a beautiful experiment, I think. So on the top is a 4T1 cell line that she's infected with uh, an oncolytic virus that expresses this ARD1A microRNA, so it should knock it down. And what she sees is a slight increase in infectivity of the 4T1 cell, so it's resistant, becomes slight, slightly more infectable uh, with the uh, artificial microRNA. But if she now adds GSK126, which is the EZH2 inhibitor, the cells are all destroyed. And this is really quite interesting at this early time point because the virus has not spread very well in this, in this model layer, and yet all the cells become sensitized which is consistent with the concept that this is because of exosome trans transport from the infected cell. And if you use a 4T1 cell which does not form exosomes, we don't see the, the effect. And here's just another cell line that we did this in, the HPAF2 cell line, which again, very, re very resistant to infection by VSV. Uh, when we add the microRNA to it on the left-hand side there, um, uh, microRNA6, you can see we start to see plaques, start to see some infection, but it's, it's still quite slow. But when we add GSK126 to that same infected culture, now many of the cells die. And so we think this is consistent with the concept that we've infected that first cell, it's producing exosomes, which are generating cargo that's going out to surrounding cells and sensitizing them to infection. So I think it's a great proof of concept, this idea of using the, the, the oncolytic virus to reprogram the exosome pathway. And you can imagine doing this, for instance, for PDL1, which we've now done and shown that it does the same sort of thing. It, it, it actually uh, sensitizes uh, cells to immunotherapy. You can do lots of different things to really change that tumor microenvironment uh, and allow it to uh, be much more therapeutically responsive. And then we showed this happen in vivo very quickly to show you in the bottom line, the money shot there is the bottom line is the one where we've combined GSK126 with the oncolytic virus expressing the microRNA. So just to end there and say that I think that, you know, that really there's a lot to be learned yet. We're, the the oncolytic virus field is exploding right now. It's really exciting. Lots of industrial commercialization interest in it as well. But I think we're really, really at the very beginning. There's lots we don't understand about how these viruses interact with the tumor microenvironment and how we can use that information to manipulate the tumor microenvironment and the adaptive immune response. And I think all these things here we have to sort of build on now. And I think the future is quite bright for us because if we can understand how these all work, we can then engineer these viruses to really manipulate the system and get much better therapeutic outcomes for patients. So I think these can be really interesting selective systemic therapeutics. They have the potent in situ and potentially programmable vaccine effect. We get tumor selective replication to heat up the tumors and lead to delivery of therapeutic transgenes, as, as Howard talked about. And then this new concept is can we use exosomes now to try to spread information throughout the tumor microenvironment or, in fact, to distant sites to try to enhance oncolytic virus therapy. And I just quickly acknowledge many of the people who, who did all the work and I get to talk about them. So thanks very much.
time, but there are questions uh, for please. Interesting talk. So I have a question to the last part, the added one. So in in endometrial cancer, almost more than eighty percent of the tumors are negative. Actually they're deleted with added one. Whereas in lung cancer, the presence of added one is important to play its role as a tumor suppressor. So the, ro the role of added one seems to be uh, mixed. In certain set instances, it's an oncogene, whereas in others, it's a tumor suppressor. Right. So in your, have you looked at, even in TNBC, it seems to be mixed outcome of the role of added one. So when you do that, what was your thoughts on to knock out or knock in? So, yeah, it's a great question, and ARD1A is a really interesting gene, as you point out, in ovarian cancer it's often deleted and probably contributes to, to tumor genesis. So we've actually looked in the cells that have lost ARD1A spontaneously because they are a tumor. The viruses grow well, so it could be a biomarker for that. And we would predict in other cells which have maintained ARD1A, uh, by using this virus strategy, will actually, it'll be good because it'll actually knock out the tumorigenic properties of it. So I think in both ways it will be interesting. There's a recent paper where you may have seen where knockout of ARD1 and it led to a more uh, uh, responsive to immune checkpoints. So I think there's lots of ways why this could be really, really interesting. Also part of it is, so have you looked at with radiation to be more relevant to triple negative breast cancer or breast cancer? We haven't done that yet, no. Thank you. It looks like we're getting a new uh, group yeah, of Thank you so much. The next session is starting. Thanks for uh, the great speaker. Thank you.